That's your check-in, that's your investments, that's your businesses, that's your property. And if we look at the latest data from the Federal Reserve Board on wealth, for every dollar of wealth white households have in America, black households have 10 pennies and Latino households have 12 pennies. So that when you have a population doesn't have much income and you don't have wealth, it means you don't have economic reserves. It means you're one paycheck away from being homeless. It means you're one paycheck away from being able to provide for your family. When my career started, most researchers thought that the racial differences in income and education and wealth were responsible for the racial differences in health. And that if you look at blacks and whites at the same level of income and education, race wouldn't matter. We now know that life is more complicated. And I'm gonna illustrate that for you with data on life expectancy at age 25 by education. What do I mean by life expectancy? At age 25, how many more years will the average black person live and the average white person live? So by age 25, the average white person will live five years longer than the average black person. That's the racial difference in life expectancy. However, if we look within whites, whites with a college degree or more education will live 6.4 years longer than whites who have not finished high school. That 6.4 within whites is bigger than the black-white gap. Blacks with a college degree or more education will live 5.3 years longer than blacks who have not finished high school. Again, you see the difference by education within blacks and within whites is bigger than the five-year black-white gap. At the same time, look at what happens. At every level of education, race still matters. So look, white high school dropouts at age 25 will live 3.1 years longer than black high school dropouts. And by the way, this is national data for the US. So this is, this is true in general for an entire year. And look what happens. As education increases, the gap widens. So whites with a college degree live 4.2 years longer than blacks with a college degree. In fact, and remember, national data for the US, this is a stunning statistic I'm showing you today, the best of black people in America, those with a college degree or more education, at age 25, have shorter life expectancy, sorry, than whites with a college degree, shorter life expectancy than whites with some college education, shorter life expectancy than whites who have finished high school. So what do these data tell us? They tell us there's something about your income or your education that matters for your health regardless of your race. But there's something else about race that matters for your health even after you take income and education into account. Because look, these are black people with a college degree or more education and look at their life expectancy compared to whites with college, even whites with high school completion. And this is national data for the US. How do we make sense of that? I and other researchers have been asking this question. Could racism be a critical missing piece of the puzzle? Could racism contribute to racial disparities in health? And when I say racism, a lot of times people think of the individual behavior of individuals, their attitudes, and so on, and that's part of racism. But when I talk about racism, I'm primarily talking about a system, a social system. And I'm talking about what they talk today about institutional discrimination and systemic discrimination and, and, and the discrimination that's embedded in policies. Let me give you an example. Here is, we have an election coming up. Here is data for the US in 2012 presidential election. How long did Americans stand in line at a precinct to vote? On average, in America, black people who went to vote waited for 23 minutes. On average, in America, white people waited for 12 minutes. Now, none of that reflected local precinct workers telling blacks to go to the end of the line, making them wait in line. No, it was linked to where you voted, how much budget had been allocated, what was the size of the facility for the precinct, what was the staffing level, how many uh, 
people were served by a precinct. Do you see what it is? It's about budgeting, it's space allocation, it's, it's, it's a, a local administrative procedures, but it led to differences in outcome, even though the people at the precinct treated everybody the same. That's what people talk about when you hear them talk about structural racism or systemic racism. They're talking about things that are embedded in policies. So the people are doing their job, but the policies are leading to unequal outcomes. I want to share with you one of the aspects of systemic racism in America. It's a legacy of racism of the past. It's called residential segregation. It was policies that determine where Americans could live based on your race. Your race and skin color could determine which neighborhood you live in. It's not legal anymore, but the structure put in place in the 19th century is still largely in place. This is a book by a historian at Duke University, and he called residential segregation by race one of the single most successful domestic policies of the 20th century in America. And I will show you the reason why he said that. What is segregation? Segregation, when it comes into a community, I, I say it's like a, a, a emission from an industrial plant. When it comes in, valuable resources disappear. Things like high quality schools, like safe playgrounds, like good jobs, like healthy air and water, like, like safe housing, like good transportation, like health care. This is a study done by uh, two of my Harvard colleagues, uh, Professor William Julius Wilson, Professor Robert Sampson. They studied 171 largest cities in America, and they said there's not even one city in America where whites live under equal conditions to blacks. And that the worst urban context within whites reside is better than the average context of black communities. That's the, the inequality at the neighborhood level. And you can see that was a 1995 study. You said, but Brother Williams, have things gotten better since then? Here is a study from published in March of this year. Uh, another colleague of mine, Dr. Dolores Acevedo Garcia at Brandeis University, she ranked every county in the, in the United States by opportunities at the neighborhood level. Opportunities like the quality of schools, like the high school graduation rates, like the employment rate and the home ownership rate, like the quality of air and water and soil pollution and hazardous waste sites, like green space and healthy food outlets and walkability. And then she looked at what percentage of all black children in the 100 largest metropolitan areas in the US are in very low or low opportunity neighborhoods. 67%, two thirds, two out of every three black children in the 100 largest metro areas are living in neighborhoods of low opportunity, as is true of 58% of Latino kids, 53% of Native American kids, and one in five white and Asian kids. Who is in the high opportunity neighborhoods? Two thirds of white and Asian kids are in the high opportunity neighborhoods compared to one in five neighborhoods. And those differences lay the trajectory of access to economic opportunity in American society. This segregation and living in places where you don't have access to opportunity, how powerful it is, it creates the racial differences in education and income and wealth that we see. Here is a study by David Cutler. He's an economist at Harvard University. Using a national study of blacks and whites, he is showing statistically, if we could eliminate residential segregation in America, we would completely eliminate black-white differences in income, in education, and in unemployment, and reduce racial differences in single motherhoods by two thirds. All of those differences are linked to opportunity at the neighborhood level. And that was a 1997 study. You say, well, is there any more recent data? I'm glad you asked. Here is another Harvard economist, Raj Chetty. He has created an opportunity atlas. He has done the most amazing study on income mobility in the United States. He looks at black and white households that start out at the same level of income. Okay, you look at, he's comparing black households and white households using all the census tracts in America starting out at the same level of income. And he looks at 
okay, the parents have the same level of income. How are their children doing? In 99% of census tracts, black boys who start out with the same level of income, household income as white boys, are earning less income in their lives. Why? They live in neighborhoods that differ in opportunity. When black boys live in neighborhoods with good resources, they do well, but that's not true in 99% of census tracts where black boys are living in America. What does this all mean? This is a social problem I'm putting for us to think about. Racial inequities in income and education and so on do not reflect a broken system. People say that, it's not a broken system. We are looking at a system that was carefully crafted, functioning as planned, successfully implementing social policies, many of which were historically rooted in racism. These are not accidents. They are not acts of God. They are not random events. It didn't just happen. These are policies that are doing what they were supposed to do. So that's the social problem I've put for you to think about. The question is, what are we as Christians supposed to do? And what, what's the meaning of this problem for the lives of people? Low economic status means that while all of us in this pandemic, right? I showed you the data, we all in the pandemic, but we're not all in the same boats when you are low in economic status. Some boats cannot handle the pandemic as well as some other boats. And so that is a problem we face. What has happened with COVID-19 is not everybody can work from home. And for low wage, non-salaried workers, working from home is a luxury and you can't social distance um, for, for many of them and they have to go to work to, to maintain uh, their positions for their family. And then one area of my research is the higher levels of stress. Low income people, minorities, blacks and Latinos have higher levels of economic stress, higher levels of psychosocial stress, loss of a loved one, higher levels of racial discrimination, higher levels of physical chemical stresses. I wanna give you a few of them and show you the consequences for health before I talk about the solutions. Here is a study done by some colleagues of mine at Harvard. What they showed is that poor and minority people in America live in communities where there's higher air pollution. And if you live in an area with higher air pollution and you get COVID-19, it's more severe and you're more likely to die. Air pollution is an independent predictor of doing worse uh, with COVID-19. The, the, the stress um, that Pastor Hoylett mentioned, the work that I have developed measures, this is the everyday discrimination scale. Um, uh, it's, it captures discrimination that exists in society. Just, just the little things, being treated with less courtesy and respect than others, receiving poorer service than others at restaurants or stores, people acting as if you are not smart, as if they're afraid of you, they think you are dishonest, they're better than you are. Just little indignities, but these things chip away at your indignity. And this slide is actually going to summarize more than 200 published studies. I haven't done all those studies, but people have published them. And it shows you what it shows just for the everyday discrimination scale. People who report high levels of everyday discrimination are more likely to get new cases of metabolic syndrome. That, that's that's um, uh, metabolic disorders that leads to chronic disease. More likely to develop cardiovascular disease. More likely to develop breast cancer and type 2 diabetes. Uh, more likely to engage in a number of high-risk behaviors, more likely to have risk factors for heart disease like visceral fat and heart rate var variation and AFib, more likely to have high blood pressure, um, more likely to have poor sleep quality and duration, more likely to have inflammation, which puts you at risk for chronic diseases and cortisol levels, uh, more likely to have become obese, linked to high levels of discrimination, less utilization of services, and worse mental health. These are just some of the findings from more than 200 studies showing the negative effects of discrimination on the health of minorities in the United States. And what are the consequences of the stress, the, 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 the chemical stress, the economic stress, the racism stress? These are terms that are being used in the scientific literature today. Accelerated aging, premature aging, biological weathering. What do people mean by these terms? 
what they are seeing, and this is what research is showing, that in America, the health of black people and other people of color is actually, we are literally aging more rapidly than whites. So that your age is not only capturing how long you have lived, but when you live in a bad environment, your age is capturing how long you've been exposed to bad environmental conditions and how physiologically compromised your body has become as, as because of that exposure. So let me explain the, the colleague who used the term weathering. Imagine a drop of water falling from the rooftop of the building you're sitting in to the concrete sidewalk below. If water drips, drips, drips today onto the sidewalk, it's no big deal. But if day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, there's a steady drip, 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 drip of water. What happens? That concrete sidewalk becomes weathered. It becomes eroded because of that constant exposure to adversity. And studies now show that you look at blacks and whites at middle age, chronologically, you're the same age. Both of you are 50. But the African-American person is in some studies seven and a half years older, in some studies 10 years older than a white person who are the same chronological age in terms of the degree of physiological dysregulation by measuring telomere length, looking at biomarkers, how your body is actually functioning. And that is the consequence of all of the poor adverse conditions of health that we face. This is data from CDC. So you see linked to that at age 50 to 64, 61% of black people have high blood pressure compared to 41% of white people. So you see the earlier onset of disease. At age uh, 50 to 64, 23% of, of black people have diabetes compared to 14% uh, of white people. And why do these things matter? Here is a study from New York City. 12 New York City hospitals, nearly 6,000 patients who were hospitalized for COVID. For all the people who went into the hospital for COVID, 57% had hypertension, 42% were obese, 34% had diabetes, 18% had heart disease. Look at this. Of all the people hospitalized in New York at those 12 hospitals, only 6% didn't have one of the health problems. And only 6% had only one. So 88% had two or more. And what I'm saying is the conditions of life, the stress, and all of this early onset of disease puts us to be vulnerable, not just for COVID-19, but for heart disease, for stroke, for cancer, for a range of chronic conditions. So the big question is, what can we do? With this big social problem I have talked about, what on earth can we do? I have written that one of the things is we need to create what I call communities of opportunity to minimize, neutralize, and dismantle the systems of racism that create inequities in health. How do we do that? We need to invest in early childhood. Um, research indicates if we can take children very early in life, even in preschool, improve the quality of opportunity and education and preparation we'll give them, they will not only do better academically in school, but they will actually have better health in childhood and adulthood. We can predict health outcomes in your 40s and 50s by what happened to you birth through five in quality of early childhood environments. We need to reduce childhood poverty. We need to enhance income and employment opportunities for youth and young adults. We need to improve neighborhood and housing conditions. We need to ensure that people get medical care that addresses the challenges they face. And we need to build political will to address inequities in care. So these are big picture things. The question is, how can we Adventists do them? And does that have anything to do with the mission that God has called us to do? I would say to you, absolutely yes. And I'm going to give you two, uh, some passages of scripture, and then I'm going to show you what we actually can do, as has been told us by the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy. What have we been called to do? Isaiah 58 is a chapter in the Bible that people who study this stuff said is the 
we, we talk about the spirit of prophecy as the lesser light that points us to the greater light. It shines with unique brightness on this chapter. It's, it's the chapter of the Bible that is quoted more than any other. And she says, it's the work of every church. Isaiah 58. And you, you want to know the details of Isaiah 58? Read the book Ministry of Healing by Ellen White. It spells it out. So what does Isaiah 58 say is our marching orders? Is not this the kind of fasting God wants? To free those who are wrongly imprisoned? To lighten the burden of those who work for you? To let the oppressed go free? And remove the chains that bind people? Is it not to share your food with the hungry? And give shelter to the homeless? Give clothes to those who need them? And do not hide from relatives who need help? This is an NLT, one version. But of Isaiah 58, it's a ministry of making a difference in the lives of others, of helping the economically disadvantaged. And if you missed it in Isaiah 58, Jesus makes it explicit in Matthew 25. He said when he comes and he's going to separate the sheep from the goat, he's going to say, come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. Why? I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to help to drink. I was a stranger. You know what a stranger is? A stranger is an immigrant. I was an immigrant, Jesus is going to say. And what did you do for me? I was naked and did you clothe me? I was sick and did you visit me? I was in prison. And in case you missed the point, Desire of Ages commenting on that passage says, Christ pictured to his disciples the scene of the great judgment day. And he represents his decision as turning on one point. What is the one point? There will be two classes and their eternal destiny will be determined by what they have done or have neglected to do for Jesus in the person of the poor and the suffering. That is our, our ministry. That is what we have been called to do. And you say, well, what could we really do? I'm going to take you on a journey down memory lane. 100 years ago, when the Adventist church implemented this ministry by taking seriously Isaiah 58 and Matthew 25 and the book Ministry of Healing. It was called the Chicago Medical Mission. It's run by Dr. John Harvey Kellogg in 1893 with the blessing of the General Conference. And he said, what he was doing was implementing what Ellen White had described that needed to be done. So what programs were established in 1893? He established the Chicago Medical Mission. It had a free medical clinic, free medical care for poor people in Chicago, a clothing distribution program, a homeless shelter that could house 400 people a night, a soup kitchen that fed 500 to 1,500 people a day, there was work at a shelter so that you, you, the homeless shelter, you came there, but there was a rug and a carpet weaving and a broom making business. So you could actually get work to earn money. He actually charged them uh, 10 cents for night, but you could work to get the money to pay uh, for your bill. Um, there was a lifeboat rescue home. I'll tell you more about that. There was a halfway house for prostitutes. Um, there was a maternity home for unwed mothers. There was a farm outside the city for drug rehab. He had a drug rehab program and a place to house homeless people. Um, there was a school for Chinese. Now the significance of the school for Chinese, remember this is 1893. If you know American history, what happened in 1882? In 1882, the United States House and Senate passed a bill and the president signed it called the Chinese Exclusion Act. If you were from China, you were banned from coming to America. So Chinese were a stigmatized population in 1893. And as part of his medical mission, he had a special place where Chinese people who were stigmatized in America at that time could come and learn lang the language so that they could may earn, earn um, a living in the United States and a visiting nurse service. All of these programs, 1893, Dr. Kellogg uh, developed. Um, just a little bit more about some of them. The farm, it was an outpost center outside of the city. He had a drug rehab program, men reclaimed from Skid Row, 
was sent there to work to be free from urban temptations. And the garden, the truck garden produced raised on the farm was used for the soup kitchen. And many rehabilitated alcoholics and homeless men employed here during the several years of operation. Kellogg's plan was for the farm to support 400 men. Here is what Kellogg did. 1893, a ministry to prostitutes. Um, Chicago had between 10,000 to 25,000 prostitutes. And this Adventist Church mission program, three programs focused on vulnerable women, a maternity home, a lifeboat rescue service, and a rescue home. The maternity home was established in 1896. It could provide shelter for pregnant women who got, with young teens who got pregnant and did not have a place to go. The lifeboat rescue service for Seventh-day Adventist women would go to the red light district of Chicago by night to talk to the prostitutes, viewed as the, the street walkers, the most desperate class of prostitutes. Working in teams of two, they worked until 1.30 in the morning. And in their first year, they were successful in persuading 75 girls to leave the street and return to a better life. 1893, I'm talking about what we were doing in the community. The Lifeboat Rescue Home for Girls was, I mentioned this one, established for unwed mothers uh, and, and so forth. Um, what else did Kellogg do as part of this program? In 1895, this is 10 years before Loma Linda, he established a medical school in Chicago as part of this citywide comprehensive outreach trying to do what the Lord had called us to do. Only nominal tuition charge. Students worked at Battle Creek, started out at Battle Creek, then came to Chicago. The college graduated over 200 physicians during its 15 years of operation. There was a big dormitory uh, for the medical students in Chicago. It was the home base for visiting nurses who worked in the low income area. And what were some of the programs that the medical school offered? A kindergarten, a daycare nursery for working moms, a free laundry for women, a free employment agency, classes in first aid, hygiene, diet, child training, dress, a placement service for orphans, a placement service for men and women who had been reclaimed from Skid Row. Why did he do this? Where did he get these ideas from? Look what Ministry of Healing says is the work of every church. This is part of our health ministry. Attention should be given to the establishment of various industries so that poor families can find employment. This is what every church should do, Ministry of Healing says. Carpenters, blacksmiths, and indeed everyone who understands some line of useful labor should feel a real responsibility to teach and help the ignorant and the unemployed. Our churches should be involved in creating job skills and job opportunities for poor families. That's Ministry of Healing, making Isaiah 58 and Matthew 25 real. Another quotation, Ministry of Healing, let the members of poor households be taught how to cook, how to make and mend their own clothing, how to nurse the sick, how to care properly for the home. Let boys and girls be thoroughly taught some useful trade or occupation. This is part of the gospel message of making a difference in our communities that we've been called to do. And Spirit of Prophecy says, in every city where we have a church, we need to have these places where treatments are given. Every church must be a training school for Christian workers. Members should be taught how to give Bible readings, yes. How to conduct and teach classes. How best to help the poor. We just read about how best to help the poor, how to care for the sick, how to work for the unconverted. In fact, this is the work of the Lord when we do this because God is concerned of the conditions of black people. Ellen White said in Southern Work, just as he said about the captivity of the children of Israel, I have seen the affliction of my people. I have heard their cry. I have come to deliver them. So the Lord wrought in freeing the southern slaves and he designs to work still further and wants us to work with him who he brought them forth to educate, to refine and to ennoble. That work still needs to be completed. Ministry of Healing makes the point clear. What is the key to successful evangelism? 
Christ's methods alone will give us true success. The Savior mingled with others as one who desired their good, showed his sympathy, ministered to their needs, won their confidence, and then he bade them follow me. Those are the steps. We are very good at shouting, follow me, but do we mingle as one who desires their good? Do we show sympathy? Are we meeting the needs of our communities and winning their confidence? That is the work that God is calling us to do. John 1, 14, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. That's what Jesus provided us. He came and pitched his tent beside ours. We are living in a world of major social problems and God wants us to pitch our tents beside our community and make a difference to improve the lives of others in our community. That is part of our making the gospel message real to our contemporary societies today. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Um, I want to remind everyone, if you have any questions, you can send them in the chat and I'll read them out. We have a few questions here. So the first one is, how did the Chicago Medical Mission Outreach projects impact the Black community? Um, I, it had a big impact on, on, on Chicago. It had a big impact on, on not just the Black community, but poor people. I could show you we're working for the Chinese, working for many disadvantaged groups. The, the president of the American Public Health Association said, has a, a statement in, in early in the 20th century where he has said he has never seen anything as remarkable as that, uh, the, the teaching of medicine with that kind of quality of social service. The, what I'm saying is the world, these, these were not Adventists, took notice of what we were doing and it was so amazing what we were doing. Our second question says, how does the Adventist church deal with social issues when we struggle with conferences that are still following the segregated formats? Um, we are struggling. That's, 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 that's the problem. I, I think we, we are struggling. And I think when we, when we are segregated the way we are, um, we, 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 we are not doing the, the work that we could be doing. And, and we are, all of us need to be working together to do this work. Uh, all of us need to be put in the resources that God has blessed us with to do this work. So I, I don't want to sp spend a lot of time on, on the topic, but I, it's, it's something I have had strong feelings about, have written about in the Adventist Review uh, of the fact that I, I don't think we can, so sociologically, I can understand the, 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 the challenges and how we got to where we are. But I, I think the time has come uh, for us to, to rise to the demands of the gospel and, and find ways to work together so that the, the, the world will see the unity. Let, let me just give you one story of, of the fact that Adventists, we don't think of it as a problem, but people see it. Um, about two years ago, I was invited to a major medical center in the United States to give a talk about racial disparities in health and, and, and inequities. And, and the vice president of that, um, uh, place picked me up um, and was driving me to the auditorium where I was going to speak. And along the way, she turned to me and she said, Dr. Williams, I, I, I heard you are Seventh-day Adventist. And I said, y yes, I am. Uh, this is a very successful um, African-American woman, doctor, and so forth. And she turned to me, but she says, help me understand this thing. I, I, I heard that your church is still divided on the question of race. educated person looking at us and saying, it, how, what, what, what is it with you Adventists? How could you still be in, in, in 2019 divided on the question of race? We don't think that people are looking at us, but if they look at us and they're saying, where, where, where is, are we saying that the gospel of Jesus Christ cannot solve this problem? That this is too hard for God to solve? I, I think it's something we should take seriously. 
Okay, our next question is, is there anything comparable in the church right now? Is there anything you are doing right now that we could study and copy? That I am doing right now. I, I, I don't work for the church. I, I, I do try to, to encourage the church to, to, um, to, to really look at what we have been given to do. There are examples of, uh, I don't think I, that is anything quite as comprehensive um, but but even um, domestically and and globally, there are examples of of, of programs that are doing m much more comprehensive um, ministry. Um, it, it is on a small scale. It is not on the scale that needs to be done. Um, but I I think if we Look at what the Bible says. Look at what Ministry of Healing says, and let's step out in faith and do it. I'll give you one, one, one example. Um, you'd say, "Well, where did Keller get all the money? He got a little money to get started from the General Conference." But take, I'll give you the story of the farm. Where did Keller get the money from the farm? He knew was developing this this drug rehab program, and he wanted a farm outside um, Illinois. Um, outside Chicago to, to, to do that. And he brought his medical students together one morning and told them we need to pray for the farm. Later that morning, he is visiting a patient at the hospital in Battle Creek. And the patient says to him, do you have any needs for your work in Chicago, your project in Chicago? And Kellogg told him, yes, I, I would like to have a farm where we could, we could do the rehab for the persons from the city and we could grow food for the shelter. And the man said, oh, I have a 180 acre uh, farm outside Chicago. And he gave it to him. God answers prayer when we step out in faith to do what he does. So that's just an example of how God met one of the needs that he had. It was a direct answer to prayer. Wonderful. Um, we have one question that says, what became of the Kellogg's mission? What became of the Kellogg's program? Uh, we hear so much about Loma Linda and how it is established and very little about the Chicago mission. Um, well, I mean, Kellogg had a break with the church um, um, the, uh, early in the, in, uh, after the turn of the century. Um, uh, Kellogg developed um, theological beliefs that the church um, uh, were, were, that were problematic. Yeah, he, he published a book that was um, uh, dealing with pantheism, um, that God is in everything, you know, um, and, and that was problematic. Um, so um, that the, the church with, 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 and, and Kellogg went separate ways. Um, over uh, some of Kellogg's beliefs. Um, one of the things I must say, um, and, you know, I, I believe we, we, we have to follow the truths of Scripture. So I, I have no sympathy um, for the erroneous beliefs that, that Kellogg developed that, that forced a break with the church. I would also want to say, though, that this, it's not often talked about when we talk about Kellogg's problems with the church. Pantheism was the straw that broke the camel's back, but it wasn't the only problem Kellogg had at the church. One of the problems Kellogg had with the church was racism. Kellogg, in his time, he and his wife raised, lived in Battle Creek, never had children of their own, but they adopted and raised in their home more than 40 kids, including black and white kids. In the late 19th century, you didn't do that. You didn't have white, uh, black kids with white kids. And the brethren had a lot of trouble with Kellogg all over the fact that he was raising black and white children under the same roof. And one time, Kellogg, um, Richard Schwartz tells a story in his autobiography of Kellogg, biography of Kellogg, tells a story of Kellogg goes out of the, the United States. Uh, he was the medical director of the Battle Creek Sanitarium Hospital, Ellen White and her husband give money to send him to medical school at University of Michigan. And he's the medical director. He goes out on a trip out of the country. And while he's gone, they put up a curtain so that the black employees at the Battle Creek Sanitarium sit on one side 
and the white employees would sit on a separate side. They couldn't sit together in the same cafeteria. And Kellogg came in, came back to the US and saw the curtain and he says, as long as I'm the medical director, tear this curtain down. And they had to do it. But I'm saying a source of conflict of Kellogg with the brethren that we do not talk about was he was much more progressive on the questions of race than, than the rest of the brethren were. So we, we, we uh, admire the things he did right. We don't support the things he did wrong, but it's an example. His, his example is it can be done. We need people to step out in faith and do what God has called us to do. Absolutely. Uh, we have another question that says, uh, today we call everyday racist attacks microaggressions. What have the studies shown about the effects of microaggressions on well-educated, more prosperous Blacks? It's not just a problem for the poor and disenfranchised members of our community. Yes, I mean, the everyday discrimination scale could be called microaggressions. I haven't used that language. Um, in general, what we find is that um, Blacks who have higher levels of education and income uh, have higher levels of, of dis experiences of discrimination and the effects I'm talking about on health. We find them on, 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 on middle-class Blacks as well as on poor Blacks. So yes, we, the, what the research shows is that expo experiences of discrimination are positively associated with income and education for Blacks. The higher your income and education, the more likely you are to experience those things. Uh, speaking of education, uh, we have a question that says, um, it says, why is there so much struggle for students in these religious institutions regarding paying their tuitions? All the time I hear that students worry about going back to school. I, I am not sure I understand the question completely. Um, is it talking about that Adventist institutions that kids don't have the money? I'm not sure. Um, I'm not exactly sure either. Whoever wrote that question, can you send me, maybe elaborate on it, send me the question again and elaborate on it? Uh, while we're waiting, I'm going to move on and ask, what do you think about collaborating with community health and social justice programs as opposed to adding programs to our current church home? Well, I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to, to make a difference. I, I do think that if there is a program in our community that we can collaborate with, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we can work with them. I think we can volunteer at programs, we can be part of, of our community, we can be good, good neighbors. Um, uh, but when there, there's programs that need to be there, we, should, we, we need to do that as well. Absolutely. And we have, our, we have one more question that says, the words of the song, work for the night is coming, takes on a new meeting in this coronavirus era. How should people who want to volunteer in these, in these helping professions proceed? Um, I would say get involved locally with what's happening in your community. Um, identify in every community. There are, there are groups that are right now working and trying to make a difference. Many of them are struggling. Many of them need resources. Many of them need volunteers. Um, and that's an example of where we don't necessarily have to go and try to reinvent the wheel, um, but we can, we can contribute. We can work alongside, um, you know, God, that's what, God wants us to do work work to help his children they are they are his children God cares about them and he has placed us here to make the love of God real to them yes um, we have one last question here this is our last question it says it would be incredible if black inventors have help from black entrepreneurs that they could work together to come up with jobs of the future in technologies. And it would be nice if we have groups that can help young people and people with ideas to flourish and be of our own. 
so we could contribute to solve problems in our community instead of putting each other down. What are the resources available to us to allow this to happen? And what do you have to say about this, Dr. Williams? Um, it, it's a great idea. I, I think we, whatever we can do to, to help ourselves and to support each other, um, we, we don't always support each other as well as we could, but um, it is a good thing. But I, I am not wedded that it, I, I think we need to get the help of whoever is willing to help to come together and let us try to, 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 to make a difference um, in, our, in our societies, in our communities. Um, and, and whoever is able and willing to work, we, we need to do it. But yes, it's, it's a great idea. I'm not, not opposed to it at all. Okay, wonderful. Uh, before I hand over to Pastor so that he can close up for us, uh, I want to ask Dr. Williams that I got some questions from some people asking if you could make your PowerPoint available so that they can have the information. I, I, I will send it to Pastor Hoylet. Okay, thank you. And we want to thank you for being here with us this afternoon. It was an amazing program, very educational. And I think we now all have a wonderful understanding of our ministry and our responsibility as Christians in our communities and in our world today. So, Pastor, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you, Ashley, and thanks to Dr. David Williams for this amazing presentation. There is so much information in this for anyone to be able to absorb in this short time. And, and I guess we have to understand that this type of information is probably the, the, the foundation of large and continued seminars and, and, and teaching in a classroom. Yeah. And so what he has done is to truncate it as much as possible for us. And we're, we're very, very, very thankful for your taking the time to do this. I want to thank our people for coming out and our guests for joining us this evening. We've learned a lot. And, and the, the issue is, is the extent to which we can integrate that knowledge and put it into the context of our local church in this time of COVID-19 to be able to do those things that we are in, in, intentional in about, um, we do some of those things in, at, a, at a small scale now, and um, we would have to be also looking at resources and, and the issue of collaboration is very, very, very strong indeed. We need to be able to collaborate and uh, find this type of uh, involvement in our local community that would make these efforts possible. I am thankful for the, the will that some of our people have and the desires and the interests. And so I just want to bless us all this evening for attending and bless Dr. Williams. This month is set to be an exciting month here at the Lehigh Church. And we all have to collate this thing when we come to the end of it. I want to thank um, some of our guests, as you mentioned, at the top of the hour, uh, I saw, um, yes, Dr. Langley and Dr. Hansel Fletcher from Loma Linda University. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, what what else Dr. Melbourne. And um, also my brother, uh, Brandon and Carlin, also uh, present with us. And I want to give him a shout out. It's his birthday today. I already sang for him this morning. I won't sing again so that the people <laughs> won't hear it. Um, and for Opal, I saw Opal on. That's Dr. <laughs> Williams' wife. And like he said, these people love me to death. I love them to death. And I appreciate taking the time. He has another appointment. And I'm going to let him go. And just pray this prayers out this evening on this wonderful occasion. I'm excited. I'm very excited. I'm very thrilled. And I'm energized. Let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for bringing Dr. Williams to speak with us, to share with us, to educate us, to refresh us and to reposition our thinking 
and also to embolden uh, thought processes that we have. And for those things that we cannot answer and deal with in, in these settings, we just pray, Lord, that you'll give us wisdom and understanding to ferret those matters that can be properly handled and those matters that we can be successful in. In the meantime, I pray that you will deepen our conviction, deepen our consecration, and may we know that in this church, the motto of open hearts, open arms, and open hands is a reality that we need to press forward on. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Uh,